Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Happy Sunday morning. A lot of us have a few smiles on our faces because our local high school team won a state championship yesterday. <laughs> so we had a great time and a great trip. Knowlton's went and Paul and I went. It was a great day, but let's praise God and have a great worship this morning. We're going to start in the Red Hen Book to page 522. 522, Jesus saves. <laughs> sing praises, worship you, hear words of encouragement, lessons from your word. We pray that you'll be with us today, help guide our hearts and our minds to be fully focused on you, help keep us safe, and help us to bring you to the world around us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. A new name in glory, 568. <laughs> Oh, 
199. Lead me to Calvary. <coughs> we'll sing the first verse and we'll stand on the last. so much for our church. We thank you for our family here this morning. Please be with those that are not with us today, that they are still here in our hearts. Be with those that are streaming online, that are watching at this time, too, that can't be here this morning. At this time, let us remember that your Bible is our holy word. It is our sword. It gets us through the day, every day of our lives. And also let us remember we are a Christian family. Let's honor all of our Christians that are fighting every day in this world. And again, bless this country as well as we go through these times. Be with our world leaders, be with our president at this time, and be with those that are um, fighting for us every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's do the pledges this morning. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a map to my feet and a lie to my path. I will hide its words in my heart that I might not sin against God. For the Christian flag, I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands. One Savior, crucified, risen, and coming again with life and liberty for all who believe. And I pledge allegiance to the American flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. Our first course this morning will be Since Jesus Took All My Sins Away. <laughs>
meditation and as we come forward to the table to partake of the Lord's Supper, let's sing glorify thy name. in the Lord's Supper, I would like for us to consider the ultimate gift that Jesus has prepared for us as well as the suffering and tremendous sacrifice that he made. Let's start with Mark 14, 65. <clears throat> then some men began to spit on him and to blindfold him and to beat him and to say to him, prophesy. And the officers struck him with the palms of their hands. Also in John 19, verse 1. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put him in a purple robe and they say, Hail, the King of the Jews. And they struck him with their hands. This is just a couple of the incidences that describe the pain and suffering that Jesus went through for us on the cross, as well as in Isaiah 52, 14, which reads, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man and his marred form beyond human likeness. So he was beaten so badly and so terribly that you could barely recognize him as a human. So the reason I brought in a passage from the Old Testament was to remind us that all the prophecies that God makes always come true, and that all the promises that he makes to us are guaranteed. Please bow with me now. Dear Heavenly Father, please be here with us this morning as we prepare to partake in the Lord's Supper. Please help us to remember and appreciate the tremendous sacrifice of your Son and the purpose and the promises that are our benefit and inheritance as a result of his pain and suffering and death that led to his triumphant resurrection and eternal life both for him and for all of us who believe. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Continue in 1 Corinthians. As Paul repeats the words that Jesus said in Matthew. Take heed, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Good morning. Good morning.
Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, he's writing this letter in about 55 AD. It's a long time ago. The church was suffering through problems of divisions in the congregation, immaturity in Christ. They were new Christians. And they were wavering from the word of God. You have to remember the Greeks, they had gods everywhere. They had gods for everything. Now Paul is telling them there's one almighty God. This letter covered many, many topics about being a Christian. But it covered tithing also. In 1 Corinthians 9, 9 through 14, it says, For it is written in the law of Moses, You shall not muzzle the ox while he is, or he, let me start over. Because <laughs> I forgot what the oxen did. It is written in the law of Moses, You shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. God is not concerned about the oxen, is he? Or is he speaking altogether for our sake? Yes, for our sake it was written. Because the plowman ought to plow and hope of, uh, and the thresher must thresh in hope of sharing of the crops. That's the object of it. If we sow spiritual things in you, it is, is it too much if we should reap material things from you? If others share the right over you, do you not more? Nevertheless, we did not use this right, but we endure all things that we may cause no hindrance to the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who perform sacred services eat the food of the temple, and those who attend regularly to the altar have their share with the altar. So also the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. Obviously from the beginning, Christianity, the flock was expected to support the shepherd. What did the shepherd Paul do with the gifts that they gave him? He did not use the gifts personally. He tied them back to the church. All to do God's work. In 1 Corinthians 16, 1 through 4, concerning the collection of the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also. On the first day of every week, let each one of you put aside and save, as he may prosper, that no collection be made when I come. And when I arrive, whomever may approve, I shall send them with letters to carry their gift to Jerusalem. And if it is fitting for me to go also, they will go with me. So they're sharing back with the struggling church in Jerusalem. The first letter was written in the spring. In the fall, Paul wrote his second letter, 2 Corinthians 8, 10 through 14. I, I give my opinion in this matter, for this is to your advantage who 
were the first to begin a year ago not only to do this, but also the desire to do it. That's tithing for Jerusalem. But now finish doing it also, that just as there was the readiness to desire it, so there may be also the completion of it by your building. For if the readiness is present, it is acceptable according to what a man has, not according to what he does not have. For this is not for the ease of others and for your affliction, but by way of equality. At this present time, your abundance being a supply for their want, that their abundance may also become a supply for your want, that there may be equality as it is written, he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathers little had no lack. Paul challenges the Corinthians to fulfill their commitment to support the poor church in Jerusalem. By doing so, they can expect their support in return. Their tithe will help create equality among the Christian churches. That's what happens today. First, they go to cover everyday expenses of our church. Second, they support our evangelist as he brings the word of God not only to us, but to many others in our community. He count challenges and counsels with our missionaries. Uh, Jamaica and India and locally. He communicates with other Church of Christ leaders. Our tithes are shared with those other Christians as needed when available. Ten percent isn't much, but if we are all faithful and cheerful givers, it can do a lot. Continuing in chapter 9, verses 6 through 11. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Let each one do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. We stand for a prayer. <clears throat> Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we can be part of your flock. That we can share in your bounty and that we can look forward to eternity in heaven by living up to our responsibilities until the time that we come to be with you. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> this morning, before we go to our prayer list, who has some praise they would like to lift up to our Heavenly Father? All right.
That's great. The sun is doing better. And the house is being built. Thank you. I was just going to say, it's just throwing a hand thing. I, I got a $100 gift card Tuesday. Anyway. Is that right? Financial <laughs> 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 blessings. Ooh, so. yeah, get to buy more candies. Okay. Yes. Uh, my son has. Okay. Prayers for successful neck surgery. <clears throat> we have some additional praise for Ken Scott, <clears throat> who is out of the hospital and doing better. Mike, Steve K's co worker, is also out of the hospital. Scott Sullivan, Tom's friend, is doing better. Terrence, Gordon's cousin, is doing better. And Chuck, Noreen's friend, is also doing better. Like to continue to have Stacy in our prayers, her challenges. Also, Andrew and Colmate, the shattered collarbone. The name, family, loss of a loved one. Cassidy, our neighbor, would also like to remain in our prayers. John. Lawrence's uncle, prayers, as well as Joshua, and Mac, Susie's brother-in-law. We keep them in our prayers. Wayne Cobb, suffering from COVID. Uh, he messaged me yesterday, but he's doing much better. <clears throat> Wayne Cobb is doing much better. Brent, Pam's nephew, the shattered collarbone. Paul, Muriel's nephew, enduring physical therapy. Donna, Carrie's friend, suffering from lung cancer. Roger, Sasha's uncle, also enduring physical therapy. Megan, Mandy's friend, Still on the ventilator. And Candy with a broken femur. We also have Sue Antolin, George Graham's sister, afflicted with brain and lung cancer. Lauren, Matthew's daughter. Still not there yet. We're still waiting on the test results for cancer and lupus. <clears throat> Bob Sotin, an aneurysm in Baldstone. Jeff Harris, undergoing surgery. And Lois, with some ankle pain. Still there. Still there. And we'll still keep the praying to Colwing Village will remain in our prayers, along with Wyatt and Weston with a concussion, as well as Jack and Vicki request our continuing prayers. Dick with his knee problems and his hip challenges. Joe and his wife remain in our prayers, as well as Lola's mother and David Sultan. <laughs> Moving on to coming events. Andy? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, my, my friend Kenny fell off and yes, he's waiting for bypass surgery. And my friend Jean and my friend Kenny are making sure that he has the
Okay, so we also have Kenny, ready for a positive result from his bypass surgery, as well as Jane, struggling with some personal issues. Yes, sir. Yeah, right there. Sorry for Jenny, she wasn't feeling well this morning. I need to send it to her. Okay, Jenny couldn't be here this morning. She is not feeling well. <laughs> Andrew? Um, this coming Saturday, I've done it for over 20 years now. Um, it's called the Bus Jam, and it's really just kind of a prayer request. Um, I just pray that our community is able to help out. We have 500 needy kids that need. Christmas presents this year in our area. Um, Bus Jam is a great event. It also helps feed the need as well. And there's a sign on the bulletin board back there if anybody wants to help out. I'll be at the North Bend Weimar all day next Saturday, so thank you. Okay, so next Saturday <clears throat> we have gifts for the children. The Bus Jam. The Bus Jam, that was it. Okay, thank you David. Your Yes, sir. Yeah, um, my uh, daughter Megan was not feeling well, and uh, so she wasn't able to uh, prepare a Thanksgiving meal tomorrow. Too. And uh, she's been improving by a calorie about that. And uh, she needs uh, uplifting prayers. Also, my water weight, I swell, is up a little this morning. Saturday evening, Light Parade in the North Bend. Other announcements this morning in our coming events. Ladies quilting every Wednesday from 10 a.m. in the upstairs quilting room. And the ladies have already moved their sewing machines for the fourth inning, but we still need to get the chairs moved. We're looking forward to our Sing Inspiration, which we have the last Sunday of every month. We're looking forward to that this evening. Sunday School for Kids upstairs every Sunday morning, starting at 9.45. And our Contemporary Cry Choir will practice for Christmas this evening at 5 o'clock. We're also going to meet a little bit early, say around 3 o'clock put up some decorations. And our December birthdays and anniversaries. On the second, we have Roy Falcon. The third, Marissa Young. <clears throat> the fourth, Sylvia Lentz. On the 11th, Thomas Brainer. The 16th, Amy Sultan. Also on the 16th, Christine Medina. <clears throat> and on the 20th, Steve Bigelow. Is there anything else that you would like to add? Please bow with me now. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you again this morning with heavy hearts. For our brothers and sisters and loved ones, we're afflicted with ailments. Who are not feeling well with their health and who have been injured. Heavenly Father, we know that you know their names <clears throat> and that you know their needs and that you know what all of us need even before we come to you in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, please be with our loved ones on the list this morning. Please comfort them, bring them good health and recuperation and healing. Pray that your will be done in all situations. Please continue to love and bless all of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
share a word with the Lord today. <laughs> okay. Well, good morning. Good morning. We are going to start a new book this morning. The Gospel of John. I'd like to turn to John chapter 1. <clears throat> Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for John's gospel account, all the things that he brings to light. And just pray that we can learn from it. It'll instruct us and comfort us and tell us your truth. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. John 1.1 1, 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus is the sent one, the Son of God. He is God, the second person of the Trinity, and he came in the flesh, not just to teach, not just to heal, not just to be an example, but to rescue us and to save us. He's not only to be respected, but he's to be worshipped. He's to be followed and trusted and believed in. And he wants us to understand him. And he wants us to react to him the way that Thomas did after the resurrection when he fell at the feet of Jesus and he worshipped him saying, My Lord and my God. And as John writes us, he wants us to enter into this story of Jesus. He wants to see the Christmas story from above, from a heavenly perspective. John said that he wrote this book so that people might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that believing they might have life through him. And for most of us, as newborn Christians, you know, we began to read the Gospel of John. And we began to understand and put together these, these pieces of who Jesus really is. But you know, you can be a, a Christ follower for a long time, and every time you come back to the Gospel of John, it's still incredible. It's simple, and yet it's very profound at the same time. And uh, it's especially true with these first few verses. It's simple enough for a child to understand, yet as adults we realize how profound these statements are. And uh, John begins his gospel at a very different place than Matthew and Luke do. Matthew and Luke describe the Christmas story that we're all familiar with. The announcement to Mary by Gabriel, the announcement to the, the shepherds by the angels, a baby born in a manger stable, the wise men that go on this incredible journey and lay down their gifts before the child, their savior, but John doesn't start with the Incarnation. He introduces us to a Jesus who has always been there. He existed long before Bethlehem, long before the earth was ever created. He always was because he is God. So in these first few verses, John tells us about the wonder and the greatness of God the Son. 
And, and John describes him as the Word. And as the Word, he, he is the expression of God's nature. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Like I said earlier, this is very simple <laughs> English, and yet the meaning behind it is so profound. And it's, it's the same is true in the Greek language. The Gospel of John is the, the easiest Greek in all of the, the New Testament. And uh, when you uh, take Greek in college, if you ever go to college and take Greek, uh, the first thing they'll have you translate is John, because it's the simplest Greek in all the New Testament to translate. Simple, but yet very powerful in its significance. So John begins by, by using a name for the second person of the Trinity, and he uses the word logos. Logos is the word in the, in the Greek language, and this word uh, captured the imagination of both the, the Greek philosophers and also the Jewish scholars. And it also captures our imagination even today as well, because when we read, in the beginning was the word, we think of Genesis 1-1, don't we? Which says, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, there always was God. And it was God who brought forth everything that he created. John says the word was with God in the beginning. And he was God. All the things that were created were created by the Word. And verse 14 tells us who this Word is. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. It's the incarnation. But all through the Genesis account, the Word of God was God's power in, a in action. God said, let there be light, and there was light. And by the power of God's word, things happen. Life happens. The universe came into being. The word of God is God's power in action. Psalms 33, 6 says, By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Psalm 107, 20 says, God sent forth his word and healed them. And delivered them from their destruction. So the word who made creation also brings God's salvation. Isaiah 55 11 says, My word that goes forth from my mouth, it will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I desire, and it will achieve the purpose for which I send it. The Word of God in Scripture almost uh, becomes this personification of God in action. And John wants us to know that God uh, is a speaking God, that He's not remote, He's not detached, where we just have to speculate and guess everything. No, God is God who speaks and He communicates to us. He's revealed himself to us in his word that became flesh. A word is something that, that gives expression to what really can't be seen. You know, it's when you start speaking to me that I really begin to know who you are. And this word, it reveals who God is. A word spoken is a bridge between two people. And God has spoken his word. God has made himself knowable through his word. He revealed himself in his creation, and he has revealed himself through all of history. But more than that, he revealed himself through his word, through the scriptures. 
He spoke through the prophets. He spoke through dreams and visions. But now he's spoken to us in a new way in his word becoming flesh and dwelling among us. In fact, in the book of Hebrews, it speaks along these very same lines in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, which says, In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. So Jesus, the Word, is the last and the full and the final complete revelation to us all. He's the Word of God. Jesus is the expression of who God is. But notice also in verse 1, Jesus is the essence of, of God's nature. John talks about the eternal nature of Jesus. In the beginning, the Word was. So before matter, before time and space, before everything else, Jesus was there. But Jesus wasn't like matter and time and space which came into being. Because verse 3 says, through Jesus, all things were made. And without Jesus, nothing was made that has been made. So Jesus pre-existed the beginning of time and space and matter. He pre-existed all things because he's divine. Jesus called himself the great I am. The Jews one day said to Jesus, you're not even 50 years old. And you claim that you've seen Abraham? And Jesus answered them, I tell you the truth. Before Abraham was born, I am. So there he's identifying himself to the Jewish leaders as the great I am. Yahweh, God in the flesh. I am the, the eternal one who now stands before you in the flesh. And in John chapter 1, John is saying, when I am speaking about the word, I'm speaking about the great I am who was always there. He pre-existed everything. And he was also with God, John says. Now the word with has this idea of a face-to-face -face relationship between two engaging parties, having this deep, intimate fellowship. So this eternal word had a face-to-face -face relationship with God the Father. And John says in verse 2 that he was with God in the beginning in a personal way. John says not only was he with God, he was God. All that God is, the Word is. He's the essence of, of God's character and nature. And the Christmas wonder is, is precisely this point, that, that the, the Word, who was God, became flesh, and he settled among us mere mortals. Through Christ, everything came into being which now exists. This is also pointed out in the book of Colossians, chapter 1 and verse 16, which says, For by Christ all things were created, the things in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether throne, thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by Christ and for Christ, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So Christ is not part of the created, he's the creator. He's the source of life, of all things. And without him, it says, nothing was made that has been made. So he makes the argument even stronger by saying, without him, without Jesus, was not anything made. Without Jesus, nothing was made. Jesus was not made because everything that was made was made by Jesus. So everything made, the angels, the seraphim, the cherubim, the universe, the stars, the planets, man, animals, vegetables, the ground, the sea, everything that was made, made Jesus made it. 
And he can't be in that category because he's not the created. He is the creator. So Christ was not made, and that's what it means to be God. But he created all things in the heavens and on earth, the things that we can see with our physical eyes. But not only that, but also the things that we can only see with our spiritual eyes. He made the unseen things. But all things were created by Christ and for Christ. And also Colossians says that he's sustaining them. He's holding them together, even to this day. Our bodies, he's holding together our bodies. He's holding together this building. He's holding together this universe. This universe would fall apart if Christ just let it go. But he's sustaining, every minute of the day, he's sustaining all material things. But through Christ, everything came into being which now exists. That means you and I were made by the Word. He knit us together in our mother's womb. You were made intentionally and with love by God the Son, the Lord Jesus. And then John says he also is the wellspring of life. Verse 4 says, in him was life. And that is saying, first of all, that Jesus is the source of all physical life. But the word that John uses here is, is much richer than just the term for physical life. It's the word zoe. And zoe, it means the life of God. Like when Jesus said, I have come that they might have life. And have it in abundance. Even as the Father has life in himself, so the Son has life in himself. Truly I say to you, if anyone hears my words and believes in him who sent me, he has everlasting life. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and he who lives and believes in me will never, ever die. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give to them everlasting life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. In him was life. Every year we go and we pick out a Christmas tree. Sometimes Hannah doesn't go with me, but uh, <laughs> but sometimes she does. But we always go pick out one, and as I'm sure some of you do too. And uh, you know, you you pick out a tree that appeals to you personally, and you take it home and you put it in a stand, you know, and, and you decorate it all up till it sparkles, till it shines, and you enjoy it for a few weeks. But the reality is that the tree's dead. But it's been severed from its roots. It'll appear alive for a while, but it's really dead. And you know, many people out there in the world, they appear to be alive. They're really not. They're really dead. They're spiritually dead. But Jesus is the one who can change all of that because he takes our spiritually dead bodies and he, he, he grafts us into his root system. And we are made evergreen. He breathes into us the word of life, the everlasting life, and we become evergreen, just like a Christmas tree. Then John goes on to say in verse 4, and that life was the light of men. And that might ring some bells because what's the first thing that God created in Genesis chapter 1? It was the light. God said, let there be light. And there was light. 
And John is intentionally connecting John chapter 1 with Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, there was life, the life of God, and then light. And John is saying, you know, there, there's, there's a whole creation that's going to come through Jesus. There's a new creation that's happening with the coming of the Messiah. It's happening through Jesus Christ, the Word. Jesus is always the source of life, and not only a new life, but light. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness of this world that's been tainted by evil, the evil one. And the light of God, the sun, shines on that darkness, and Jesus, he, he turns his light on in these dark times, in our dark lives, and suddenly we can see like we've never seen before. Because now we have spiritual eyes, and we are given a taste of godly wisdom. And John says, the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness could not put it out. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Or some versions also say, has not understood it. But I think overcame is a, is a better translation. It can be translated understood or comprehend or overtake, overcome. Now the other place that this Greek word is used is in John chapter 12 and verse 35, which says there, walk while you have the light, lest the darkness overtake you. So the warning there is that if you don't walk in the light, the, the darkness is going to swallow you up. You'll be overcome by the darkness. And this is the only other place that that word is used in the gospel. So I think it stands to reason that it should have the same meaning here. But it may have been John's intention for a double meaning because John sometimes in his gospel uses words that do have double meanings to them. And the Greek word here is katalambano, and it's similar to our English word grasp. Because the word grasp can have two different meanings, right? You can physically grasp something with your hands, but you can also intellectually grasp something with your minds, right? Uh, so, for all we know, maybe John thought he just used the word and it could, have, it could go either way. It could have both meanings. The darkness can't overcome, overpower the light, and the darkness can't comprehend the light either. It's true to say the same for both. The darkness doesn't understand the light, but it's also true that the darkness cannot overpower the light. Because the light of Jesus is always going to triumph. The light of Jesus is always going to be victorious. No, no darkness, no evil can overtake him or defeat him. And when Jesus' light shined in the darkness of the world, he dispelled the darkness, the darkness of sin and evil and death and hell. The light of Jesus will not and cannot be snuffed out. John 3.19 says, This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love the darkness instead of the light because their deeds were evil. So darkness is, is the power of evil that causes men to, to love darkness and to run away from the light and goodness. But the light of Jesus shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot snuff it out. And if we are in Christ, the same is true for you and I. John chapter 12, verse 36 says, Put your trust in the light while you have it, so that you may become sons of light. So when you trust in the light of Jesus and leave the darkness, you become sons of light. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 8, Paul says, You were once darkness, but now you are light. <clears throat> he 
He says, in the Lord live as children of light. And so going back to John chapter 1 and verse 5, when John says, the light of Jesus shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overpowered it, we also cannot be overtaken if we stay connected to the light of Jesus. And this is important in 2021 going into 2022. Because every time you turn on the news, it looks like the darkness is going to overcome. But if we stay connected to Jesus, the darkness will not overcome us. And as soon as Jesus is born, what happens? Herod, representing the darkness, tries to snuff out the light. But the darkness could not overpower the light. And it continued to try to put out the light. They tried and convict him, and they crucified him on a tree. But even death could not put out the light because he conquered the grave, and he shines all the brighter. And he continues to shine, and he continues to give us life and light to all that will abide in him. For thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. In John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Christ wants to turn on his light in our lives. He wants to expose those dark places. And he wants to heal us with that light as he exposes our soul to his glory and to his grace, to his healing power. And then we truly will have this abundant life that he's talking about. We'll have it here on earth, and then it will transcend this earth also to the end of time. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you for what he's meant to us. We thank you that he has created us, that he's taken on flesh and died for our sins and given us life, that we can be spiritually alive, that we can, as we are exposed to his light, see the darkness in our life that needs to be changed. We thank you for the power that he brings and the hope that he brings. And we just pray, Lord, that this Christmas season that our focus will be on Jesus. The power of Jesus, the life of Jesus, the light of Jesus, the truth of Jesus. How amazing it is. We thank you for John's gospel, that we have it. A book that's simple for children to understand, but also still it's so profound for us as adults. We pray that we may learn from that. Be with us this week, Lord, as we go out. Help us to be the shining lights that uh, we have because we are connected to the sun. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand as we sing 563 in the Red Book. 563. There's a call comes ringing o'er the restless wind. Send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save. Send the light, send the light, send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine 
Father, we ask that you bless us as we leave this morning. And Father, that we're able to absorb the lesson and incorporate it into our lives. We're so thankful for Jesus. We're just so thankful, Lord, for the promises we have. We just pray, Lord, that each one of us will strive each day to be faithful to you. Walk with you, Lord, in our lives. Just ask you to guide us, watch over us this afternoon. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. And another reminder, sing inspiration tonight at 6. There's still room if anybody wants to do a poem or reading as well. So we'll see you tonight. Family of God Chorus. I'm so glad I'm walking. He gave it to me only because he ate so many of them. He got he's getting sick of them. What? Take that home. Yeah.